Thank you everyone for being here for the second day of our Ag Bio Theta All Hands meeting. We've got three fantastic talks um, and then we'll be doing our first ever awards for people who have been really instrumental for the network. So I hope you'll definitely stay to hear who our award winners are. Um, and then we'll be doing some breakout groups. So we'll, we really wanna hear what you think about these presentations. Um, so that's just a general overview of where we're headed for the day. Um, and to start out, we're very excited to have Peter Selby. He's going to be talking about a working group that's wrapping up um, its work from the past couple of years, the Data Federation Working Group. Um, Peter has also joined our steering committee, which we're all very excited about. Um, and his talk is titled, How to Implement Practical Data Federation Technology Review and Training Material. Awesome. Thank you, Meg. Um... Yeah, so I probably have too many slides here, so keep me on on time. But um, yeah, so thank you, everyone. Um, Pete Selby, um, um here speaking on behalf of the uh, Data Federation Training Working Group. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll dive right into it here. Um, so first, we want to start make sure everyone's on the same page defining data federation in the broadest scope. Um, and I, I came up with this little diagram uh, a while ago to try and help illustrate the point. Um, it, sort of if we're if we're looking at the the scale of data sharing in general, um, you can you can share data all sorts of different ways, uh, you know, uh, manual physical documents uh, all the way up to to servers and, and automation um so it, we're we're looking at generally data sharing within the community um specifically with programmatic access to to data being able to you know have machine readable data and uh, have it accessed programmatically and then sort of the the next layer on top of that, I would say, is, is data federation, where the data uh, can sync um, uh, easily uh, with uh, with of other data sources um, and uh, become one sort of large pool of data that can be accessed. Um, so this working group uh, came out of there. There was a data federation working group. Um, in 2022, and one of the outcomes of that group was a, a survey in which we were trying to figure out um, sort of what the Ag Bio data community needed. Um, and uh, the, of course, the top two um, blockers for implementing data sharing, data federation were uh, time and resources. Um, but the, the third option was uh, general technical awareness. And so that was the inspiration for this working group um, to, to try and generate some, some technical awareness and, and training materials um, for the community around uh, automated data sharing and um, uh, data federation. Um, so uh, we also, as part of that survey, we're looking at um, what sorts of technologies people might be interested in learning about. Um, we've got some pretty um, decisive information here in, in terms of uh, what people felt comfortable with versus uh, what they wanted to learn more about. Um, so the, yeah, this working group was uh, formed um, with the objective of uh, generating some of these uh, training materials uh, to try and just high level learn about um, uh, some of the technologies that were in the survey, as as well as some some of the others, uh, some others that we we thought of. So, um, uh, yeah, roughly one third of the the survey respondents indicated that they would benefit from learning more about um, some of these technologies, and so that was that was set out as our uh, as our primary objective for the working group. Um, and the question was, how do we do this? Because uh, the members of the group, we were not experts in <laughs> most of these technologies. Um, and so, uh, yeah, how do you do this? You ask the experts. Um, and so we, from the survey, as well as some brainstorming we did at the beginning of the working group, um, we came up with a, a list of technologies uh, that 
we we wanted to learn about and, and felt that the community would benefit from. Um, here's a, a few of them here. Um, and uh, yeah, so then we, we started finding uh, experts uh, within each of these, uh, experts in each of these technologies within sort of our communities and, and uh, um, general uh, bio biology academia fields. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'm going to run through a few. I'm, I'm going to run through these uh, presentations that we've uh, received uh, in the past year, um, and uh, just quickly uh, sort of highlights from from each one of them. Um, I won't I won't get too deep. Um, yeah, so we had a, a presentation from uh, Cyril Pommier uh, regarding the, their tool Fader, um, which is a, a index driven um, search tool uh, can connect to many, many different uh, data sources and, and has connected to many, many different data sources um, to sort of search across uh, many, many resources simultaneously. Um, we talked to Nirav Merchant around uh, iRODs. Um, and saw you know some of the benefits of of irods in terms of uh, raw raw data access um, uh, and and being able to set up a uh, a network of data sharing um, primarily file based data sharing um, uh, but yeah still being able to uh, uh, increase the 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 findability and accessibility um, of of certain data types uh, within a within a network within a shared network. Um, we got a presentation from Mark Wilkinson on RDF and some of the tools his team is working on, um, uh, particularly a tool called Shallot. Um, and this was more around uh, creating. Uh, shared data models and and sort of standards for data, uh, and then being able to immediately um, share and, and communicate those th that that data uh, using the standard model agreed upon within a community. Uh, um, and so, you know, this is uh, a, a way of of generating um, a, a a shared model that uh, uh, can be added to another technology um, to actually share the data back and forth. Um, I gave a presentation. Uh, this is uh, my project, Brappy. Um, again, this is uh, a, a defined data standard, so needs to be sort of added to uh, another piece of technology to enhance the, the sharing capabilities. Um, but uh, sort of defining this uh, Data standard within the the breeding domain um, allows everyone to speak a common language and makes it, it makes it easier to to share programmatically uh, in particular. Um, we talked to uh, Asi Salab around uh, GraphQL and some of the projects he's working on in GraphQL. Um, again, similar to uh, the the last two RDF and and Brappy, this is more about defining a shared standard. Um, within a community, um, as well as uh, a, a highly flexible and fast uh, sharing component. Once you have um, a, a data model that you're uh, agreed upon, um, the GraphQL system is really, really flexible and powerful in terms of searching and um, data discovery. Um, we talked to, uh, uh, forgive me, I'm going to butcher this name, Natasha Pavlovich um, uh, around Globus. Um, and Globus, uh, a really, really efficient way of storing and sharing large data sets. That's sort of what they've built their model around, is uh, being able to share these large data sets uh, within a community, and within a network of, of connected data nodes. Um, um, yeah, be powerful uh, sharing and and data discovery tools uh, sort of built around this the Globus platform. 
Um, and uh, we talked to Mark again uh, somewhat recently about uh, solid and, and linked data. This is a somewhat new um, uh, idea, new concept uh, uh, up, up and coming um, around having these uh, personal data pods and, and being able to um, have uh, very effective interoperability between data sets um, and, and particular uh, emphasis on data ownership and, and control um, and being able to set up a pod of your own data where you control and maintain um, uh, all that data with easy interoperability of, of other sources. Um, yeah, so those, those are the technologies we've uh, reviewed so far. Um, and as part of this working group, we wanted to uh, we, we've got recordings of each of those presentations. We've got uh, notes that we took uh, and uh, sort of some Q&A we've uh, recorded um, from each of those presentations. Um, and yeah, and the next piece of that, uh, we started uh, developing um, a, a sort of miniature website, uh, collecting all this material together um with the presentation recordings uh some of our analysis on on the, these different technologies um and recommendations for for different use cases they might be useful in um and uh yes there there's still some future work to do you still have some uh polish and and uh, some uh, documentation that still needs to be written before this is totally ready to publish um, but uh, it's it's getting close. Um, if this is successful and and useful to the AgBio data community, um, we would want to look into some future work in terms of uh, sort of additional technologies that people might be interested in, adding them to the um, to the pile. Um, we talked at one point about uh, sort of a pilot program of building out one of these, you know, one of one of these use cases um, within the ag biodata community as sort of a proof of concept to try and uh, further uh, encourage people to adopt some of these technologies. Um, but uh, since the working group is coming to an end uh, this this year, um, these these will really have to wait to see if this. Uh, is useful to the community and, and if this is something we want to pick back up in a in a future working group uh, to, to continue. Um, yeah, uh, uh, here's the link to the current work in progress. Um, it's not not completely finished yet, so that please uh, don't judge it too harshly. But yeah, we've, we've started sort of putting this material uh, up on the on GitHub. Um, we had a great conversation uh, yesterday with the education group, so might be uh, able to turn this into an education module at some point uh, as part as part of the education group's work. Um, but yeah, for, for now, this is this is where it is. Um, and yeah, here are the the members of the working group, and I'd like to thank this, the, the whole group for putting a lot of work in and and um, uh, making this possible. Um, and with that, I'll uh, wrap up. Is there any questions? Yeah, we have we have time for a question. Thank you so much, Peter. You can post your question to the chat or just unmute and uh, and let us hear from you. So, Peter, I just had a a question. That was great, by the way. Um, about uh. If we're, you know, the potential of working with the education working group, which I think is fantastic. Um, and were we considering um, collecting some possible use cases from the group, right, where we could, you know, then demonstrate, right? We've seen lots of, like, when we were talking to these groups, we, we saw a lot of, like, use cases, but they were much more general, kind of like how this tool works, as opposed to, more specific to this group. So I'm thinking if we, you know, had sure. any plans to um, maybe, you know, pull together a few potential use cases and then just kind of let the group vote or something like what would be most, most accessible to everybody. Yeah, um, no, no definite plans there. Um, 
uh, we have collected some use cases in the past uh, and sort of part of part of that poll from the original uh, working group was trying to figure out what would be useful to the community, what sorts of things could we do. Um, yeah, and and you know, in talking to all these different experts, there they were uh, most of them were pretty clear on ter in terms of like this tool would be really good for this type of use case. Um, so yeah, nothing nothing definite yet that we want to follow up on, but um, certainly if if the community finds it useful, uh, you know maybe some some future uh, working group can be put to the task of actually implementing uh, or you know doing some proof of concept. Um, uh, perhaps, you know, maybe not even a working group, but just a, a, uh, some members of the community, if they're interested, uh, trying trying some of these things out would be would be good too. So, yeah, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go from here. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, great, great question and answer. Very exciting. Um, so we're going to move on now to our two active working groups. Um, the first one is going to be the SCRNA Seq BioCuration or SCRNA Bio um, for single cell. Uh, we're going to hear from Sunita Kamari, who will be her talk is titled "Standardizing SCRNA Seq Metadata of Plants and Animals to Promote Verification." So, Sunita, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Meg. Let me share my screen. Make it a slideshow. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Looks great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So okay. What? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm uh, presenting on behalf of a single cell bioculation working group today. And uh, first I would like to know who we are. So this group is quite a new working group. So first I will start with, you know, uh, like uh, so how many members are there? So we have 24 members from six different countries. And you see it is a diverse group. One third members are working on plants and the rest two thirds are working on animals. So it is a global team which may pose some difficulties with time zone differences. Uh, Chris Tegel uh, from Iowa State University is chairing this group and Ben uh, Call from Plant Cell Atlas and I from Cold Spring Harbor are co-chair of this group. Most of the members are associated with the FANG project and um, AG2PI and Plant Cell Atlas. So now let me give a brief background on single cell RNA-seq. So you may already know that bulk RNA-seq provides an average gene expression profile for a population of cells, we call it tissue, while single cell RNA-seq allows for the study of gene expression in individual cells. So here is the simplified version of the workflow uh, for single cell RNA-seq on plants. It starts from isolation of the cells from tissue samples, capturing of the single cells, then wrapping of each individual cell with a bead inside a nanoscale droplet so that bead contains unique molecular identifiers and then barcoding and amplification of the, sorry, complementary DNA and uh, then library preparation procedures. Then after single cell RNA-seq, the snapshot, uh, snapshot data would be analyzed to present and classify the landscape of gene expression in cells uh, of a heterogeneous population. So in addition to single cell RNA-seq, there is a single nucleus RNA-seq as well. That is an alternative method that captures the mRNA in the nucleus of, uh, nucleus of cells. Um, it is useful where cells are not easily separated into single cell suspensions. So that is applicable generally for frozen samples. So why a single cell RNA-seq is important? Uh, because it helps in identifying distinct cell populations and states that might be masked in bulk RNA-seq data. And it also characterizes novel or rare cell types, helpful in developmental biology and gene regulatory analysis, um, because it identify key regulators of cellular processes and cell fate decisions. In case of animals, it is very valuable in a human schedule for studying the tumor microenvironment, which comprises diverse cell types, including cancer cells, immune cells, and stromal cells. So this can help researchers understand the interactions between these cells, how their states change over time, their roles in cancer progressions, and response to therapy. 
So one important application of the single cell RNA seq technology is to build a better and high resolution catalog of cells in all living organisms. And this is, we call it atlas, like a plant cell atlas, human cell atlas, animal specific atlas, like Drosophila, like pig cell atlas, like that. So these atlases are key resources to better understand growth and development of these organisms and also provide a solution in treating dis disorders and disease. So uh, next one is why there is a need on community-wide resources. So, you know, excellent research can be done at a single lab level with significant effort. But if you would like to solve uh, like complex problems, like the problems that we have mentioned here, for example, single cell data and metadata storage, and you want to share it with the community, you would like to utilize the organism-wide data for optimal cell annotation and gene regulatory networks. You would like to improve annotation of reference assembly with single cell data, analytic, analytical data pipelines for development and validation, and comparative analysis of single cell data across species. This, this type of things is not, uh, it's quite difficult and almost impossible sometimes. So therefore, we need the community resource. So right now there is no portal exists to provide access to all public single cell rna seq data for agricultural species and very little metadata is available for most such data sets. So it, that's therefore it is very uh, you know difficult to use this data. And so if we have community wide resources, it will increase the agricultural research output and reproducibility could be significantly improved. So um, next one I actually would like to highlight here uh, is the latest plant cell publication. So this is published in uh, March and Ben Call from Plant Cell Atlas, which is part of our working group. Uh, he is also one of the co-author of this uh, paper. Uh, so this is paper actually I would like to highlight here. It is a community effort and 17 plant researchers across the globe, they have tried to identify the challenges which are associated in plant single cell biology. And I believe these will be the same challenges with animals as well. So these eight main challenges they have associated, these are like, you know, deciding on the uh, best single cell methods to answer a specific biological question, understanding the experimental variability, biases in protocols and platforms, and then uh, deciding on sequencing strategy, uh, generating expression matrix and defining high quality cells and then construction of the cell clusters and mapping them to the cell types. What are the challenges associated with that? This is a big challenge over there. And then trajectory, uh, like, you know, where you are using the inference methods and applications. So those are the trajectory inference, validation, and then documentation, documenting and publishing this data set. So these, all of the challenges are discussed in detail in this paper. I go, went through this paper and it's really quite interesting. And uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, issues that we are talking about when we are handling the single cell rna seq data they have mentioned here. But for this working group, we are focused on uh, data storage and metadata associated challenge that, and where we would like to have community efforts. So metadata is really crucial, we all know because metadata is important for understanding the complexities of single cell data set to derive valuable biological insights. And there are challenges in comparison and integration of single cell data set across the different studies because of the lack of metadata. There is an inconsistency in experimental protocol and sample handling, which may lead to batch effects. And there is annotation discrepancy, which hinders the accurate comparison of single cell rna seq data. There's a lack of comprehensive agricultural metadata, which is really essential for reproducibility. And inconsistent sample preparation and sequencing technology, they contribute to technical variability that can confound the biological signals. And so reproducibility and interpretation of the results across the different st uh, studies, that becomes really difficult. So it is really important to curate and uh, document metadata that adheres to fair principles, which would not only enhance the reusability of single cell rna seq data, but it will also ensure that these studies are robust, these are reliable, and uh, we can also, uh, it is also important to gain understanding of cellular heterogeneity and disease and biological processes across the studies. So it's really very crucial, and that's the reason we are just uh, going to focus this thing uh, on in this working group. 
And so this main goal of the working group will be to address the annotation challenges of single cell RNA seq metadata in plants and animals and establish a set of recommendations for member database on management of single cell RNA seq data set. Then we will work on a compilation of minimum standards for metadata describing species, strain, cultivar, developmental stages, cell types, etc., uh, using appropriate ontologies and details of experimental design. So this minimum information is required for storing, analysis, and data reuse. reuse. Okay. So what is our uh, working group? What are what we will be working on? So we will be working on. Um, uh, we will we will survey communities, identify existing tools and approaches for single cell data and metadata collection and storage. Then we will determine additional community needs and potential resources for expanding metadata and risk single uh, cell data repositories, including genome portals that display cell type level annotations. We will review best practice recommendations for integration of member database data, like uh, larger, like, you know, public international sequence nucleotide databases are there, like GEO, ANA, DDBJ, and plant cell atlas, single cell expression atlas, FANG group, et cetera. So we will review uh, all those best practice recommendations from them, and we'll try to see what are their gaps and how we can fill those gaps. So, um, so what deliverables we will be going to produce? So we will uh, define the data and metadata for single cell RNA seq studies using standardized strong ontology, and there are several current challenges which are addressed by the group, and we will be addressing two. And then there are uh, we will also work on uh, developing some uh, database of community data types, selection of data set for major species that can be used for benchmarking methods and then establish integration routes and processes for connecting to large single cell data integration efforts. And finally, white paper that will be documenting recommendations for fair metadata, data type, and recommended methods and pipelines for management of single cell data. And this is all our visions. So we may refine it because we is a quite pretty new group. So we are just still working on it and thinking about it. So it might be quite big. So we may need to refine it depending upon that, how does it go? Um, but these are something that we are really um, quite excited and thinking uh, to do it. Uh, so how important is our work for the community? So it will facilitate uh, in creating a cohesive community that will provide standards, resources, tools, and standardized single cell rna data datasets for fair data meta-analysis that will be leading to initial cell type transcriptome descriptions. And this is really strong demand for this. It's a quite pretty uh, new field. Um, so now here is another thing that I would like to mention here. And so Chris from Iowa State University and uh, Muskan, who, who is working with Chris, they have received one HTTPI seed grant. And then they are also uh, working on further um, more on this, uh, 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 for this community annotation of cell types. So this is uh, another possible funding opportunity uh, which funds both conferences and standard research projects to develop community solutions to solve the genome to phenome problems. And we are uh, with this group, we are also working on community annotation of cell types and then how to apply the single cell data to biology and breeding phenotypes. Uh, so Chris um, Bain call from PCA and Wes from University of Missouri, myself and Doreen from Cold Spring Harbor, Peter from EBI and Fiona from University of Arizona and Sue from Michigan State University. We are part of this AGTPI project and we are also trying to resolve some of those issues. Yeah, so we, and if you are really interested in this initiative, please contact us and please let us know how can we help you guys. Um, Next are some questions for breakout session and we can have more questions like, you know, but we are just, I just thought about it that how uh, we can discuss during breakout session, but these are like something how to create a community of researchers which are interested in this particular field and how to motivate people. So the second question is really interest, very important because most of the times that when we submit this data, that metadata is not uh, submitted correct. And uh, so that is how to motivate people for keeping standards for their gene expression submission, how to incentivize them 
uh, that we can discuss and we will need we need curators annotators and what we are missing what can be added to these offers and any funding opportunities so with this uh, i will say thanks to you all for listening yeah that's it Thank you so much, Sunita. Um, we have time for a question. If anybody wants to put something in the chat or unmute and uh, go for it. Yeah, sure. Leonor, you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I, my son accidentally knocked me out of the um, chat. Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering about with the ontologies, whether or not um, the ontologies that we have, like existing ontologies are sufficient for um, single cell descriptions or whether or not, like I'm thinking particularly about like sort of cell types and whether or not there's work that needs to be done in that area. Yeah, so this is a very good question. So some of those like uh, ontologies related to plant uh, uh, tissues, like on growth and development that Plantium is working on, we have very good ontologies, but regarding cell states, we need to work on that. And they need biological markers for that. And uh, so that is something uh, is uh, definitely need a lot of expert uh, people who can identify those cell states. But other than that, we do have trait ontology and growth and development ontology, but we still need a lot more ontologies. Yes, definitely we need much many more ontologies for plants specifically. I know there's many uh, words that we are not using the standard words and we do not have ontology for those. Thank you, Sunita. Very, um, very interesting work and exciting new technology. Um, yes. So we are going to move on. We're, we're, we're doing great on time, but we're going to go ahead and move on to our, our third and last presentation, which is another active working group. Um, Josh Young is going to be telling us about the sustainability working group, and his talk title is Updates from the Sustainability Working Group. So Josh, I will let you tell us all about that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Josh Young. I'm at Phoenix Bioinformatics, but I'm speaking on behalf of the Sustainability Working Group. Um, I definitely believe in the title, what it is. And so uh, I'll go through a series of updates from the working group. So I thought it would be good to refresh everybody what the charges were to the working group. Um, it's quite an expansive uh, collection of uh, items that touch on many aspects of the operational side of uh, ag biodata resources. Um, we were charged with exploring what might be new uh, possible funding avenues, how the resources could perhaps uh, reduce their costs, save funds, and then also assessment of uh, policy and procedure and how those impact the operations of grants or of resources. So next, uh, here's our members that are active um, and have been active for the last couple of years. We have a, a good mix of folks coming from a variety of well scientific uh, disciplines or species studied. Um, I. I, of course, am in more of an administration perspective. So it's it's a good group. We've got uh, representation at kind of the global scale with Chuck Cook um, helping connect us to some of the things happening at the Global Biodata Coalition and then several active PIs of resources as well. So I want to talk about what we have done prior before getting into current activities. So uh, kind of in the first year, the primary focus uh, was a survey of ag biodata membership and the variety of resources represented explicitly on those, those three things that were core to our charge. Uh, the, that's what funding uh, strategies do you employ what funding strategies would you consider or have uh, possibly explored if not implemented? And what are your strategies for cost reduction and, and how does policy 
uh, affect your ability to operate. And we got a very good response rate. We were able to document a wide range of perspectives. Now, I will be clear that this was self-reported data, and that's that's still very valuable, but it is of a different nature. It's how people perceive their own projects. And so the next step was to uh, to identify resources that we could go a, a deeper dive on. And the working group spent quite a lot of time developing a, a list of criteria to try to make sure that we could balance um, both kind of the scientific uh, species of study and the different types of user communities, whether it is, um, say, a, a very focused user community or something that spans multiple communities. And then we reached out and invited uh, resources to participate in the next step. And so um, personal appeals to principal investigators were submitted into the last fall, uh, into the winter. Appeals were made at um, conference talks uh, for, frankly, anyone who um, managed a resource that would fit within the ag biodata umbrella. Um, to, to get involved in this process. And the next step for 2024 was moving beyond that self-reported um, data to a more formal model. And I'm, I'm going to use a word that often shocks or causes alarm, but this is the, the formal model is not an audit, but it is more akin to an audit than completing a survey, right? It is, it's a very intensive process. Um, it's, it's no longer um, essentially just reporting what your costs are or what you're interested in. It's showing the receipts. And unfortunately, uh, we were not able um, to get the kind of response we were hoping for to do the formal modeling. Um, and so in 2024, the working group pivoted and focused on uh, a more qualitative approach with uh, leaders of ag biodata resources, um, moving to interviews as the format. Thus far, um, seven principal investigators for ag biodata member resources um, have, have had these semi-structured interviews. And I will say this is still going beyond the survey that was completed in the first year of the working group, um, but it is, it is still self-reported data. And so it allows us to explore the perceived strengths, challenges, and opportunities for their future, re for their resources in the future with more back and forth, um, certainly compared to the survey that was done before. And it results in uh, a recording and then documentation of each of those conversations. Now, I do need to note that uh, the individuals interviewed or the resources represented are all confidential, um, understandably so. But that work is still continuing. The next steps um, is to uh, send the, the uh, transcription, the record of the interviews for each of the PIs to verify that it accurately reflects uh, their statements, uh, schedule a few remaining uh, resource PI interviews in May, and then complete the analysis and synthesis across interviews. And then the sustainability working group uh, will uh, review the draft report um, at the end of May. And I did want to share just a few um, preliminary themes, and I'll just go ahead and preface that I'm uh, not the individual doing the, the work of the interviews. That is uh, Shabri Subramanian and uh, Dory Main. And so um, if you have specific questions about these overall preliminary themes, 
I, I don't have, uh, I wasn't the one doing the interview, so I cannot provide additional details. Um, but uh, at this level, it is prioritization is uh, being forced just because of resource constraints. And as a result of resource constraints, there can be more staff turnover or loss of staff, which results in loss of uh, expertise and knowledge. And then uh, many of the resources know organizational constraints around uh, hiring time and the ability to offer competitive salaries for the, the skill sets required for maintaining and supporting these resources. And then the challenges associated with flat funds in general. However, there was an overarching uh, excitement for the opportunities in the database space or the resource space uh, with proper funding, there's a lot of exciting uh, new capabilities that can be built and deployed and uh, general support for participating through ag bio data and connecting with other uh, leaders and staff on resources. So what what is confirmed for the working group going forward? Um, obviously, the annual report for the working group, but there will be a white paper drafted based on the work that has been done, uh, both the introductory year survey and then this interview process. And I should mention there are several resources that have done um, this kind of formal modeling uh, that have noted they're willing to have their results included in that as well. Um, the Working group is very interested in doing a what might be termed an opinion piece um, about the need and value of these resources. And there's also a presentation already scheduled for in June. So just a little, uh, about two months on the impact of community databases. And lastly, I'll note these are, are possible um, not confirmed, but there's a lot of interest in the working group um, around a, a workshop or a community of practice that continues really focused on the staff at Ag Biodata member resources, focused on demonstrating the value of these resources. And there's been a, a variety of ways that have come up as a key to doing this. Um, really understanding the, the usage data, right? Understanding how your users interact with the resource and uh, what's important to them. But then also the scientometrics, right? So looking at first order publication records that tie back to the resource, but then also uh, the references and usage of those publications as well to, to start to be able to demonstrate um, what the impact of these resources are. And there, there is also a discussion about um, some resources have been able to develop a, a workflow to run that scientometrics in the background. And perhaps there's an opportunity to develop something that is at least at a generic level available for, for all resources um, to have that kind of documentation of their community of use. And with that, thank you. And as, as is always the case, this is part of uh, the NSF funded RCN work. Any questions? Yeah, we definitely have um, time for a question for Josh. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, again, chat or unmute. Jackie, I see your hand up. Please share. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. This is also something that's very interesting is just how to, to maintain this great work that we've been doing. Um, my question is regarding the um, the Nelson memo that's saying basically data needs to be publicly available one year after publication. There's been some talk basically within, you know, with another database staff, like how are we going to handle uh, the potential influx of data when this really comes into, into play, when it's required, um, when we can, we can barely handle what we're, what we have now. 
did, was that a question that you asked um, for these interviews or is it some does anybody else have an idea of how we're going to sustain be sustainable you know further down the line so for i can i can answer kind of generically because i've i've seen the the um the list of questions for the semi-structured interviews, right? And so it was not an explicit question that was asked to everyone. Um, what I can say was there was a question about uh, concerns, opportunities, uh, the, the kind of generic you know, SWOT analysis for resources. And so I suspect that might've come up under that purview, um, but we did not have an explicit question about the Nelson memo that was part of the semi-structured interviews. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, very interesting. Um, yes, uh, thank you again, Josh, and any additional comments, please feel free to post them in the channel uh, to everyone or directly to Josh. Um, with this, we are going to move on to something I'm very excited about. Um, for the first time, we have decided to give out a series of awards um, to Ag Bio Data Network members. Um, and this is an idea that Anna Rita Morano came up with, um, our great program director. And I think it, it it's just a great way to recognize that so many of the people on this call and part of our working groups are donating their time and doing service to their communities, um, and they're not getting a lot of financial reward for it. So I think this is a way for us to say, we see you and we appreciate you. Um, so we're very excited. Um, Shushma is, is Nathani is going to go ahead and uh, announce the winners of our four brand new award categories. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm very excited to share these awards information. Okay, so our first award for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Award goes to Susan McCarthy. Our second award is for the Mission and Leadership Award and it is going to Monica. Our third award is Egg Biodata Purification Award, and it goes to David Mollick. So these are the four categories of the awards that we came up with. I think you missed one, the Working Group Champion. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. And then Working Group Champion Award, uh, yeah, so Working Group Champion Award goes to Cecilia Deng. So yeah. I, yeah, so congratulations to everyone. And we are very happy to recognize you to have this opportunity to recognize all four of you. Uh -huh. uh, it has been a pleasure working with you. Um, I have a few sentences about each of the awardees that I can share from their nomination forms, um, just very briefly. So for Susan McCarthy, um, for diversity, equity, and inclusion, she's been a part of the DEI working group. Um, she has worked tirelessly to contact underrepresented groups or organizations, and it is thanks to her that we have established contact with the 1890 land-grant programs. So very appreciative of her work, very, very strong uh, connections made there. Um, for Cecilia Ding, Working Group Champion Award. Um, for the Genotype and Phenotype Working Group, she's very active. Um, even though she had to join at a very inconvenient time, she is many, many time zones away on the other side of the world. Um, so it was extra, extra work for her to make that happen. Um, she was one of the final editors for the paper and made a huge effort in getting the publication out the door. Um, and she was actively participating in almost all the meetings, discussions, and writing the manuscript. So thanks, Billy, Cecilia. Um, for Monica, just absolutely fantastic steering committee member. Um, she's the most committed to Ag Bio Data, and she's always motivated and dedicated to all of our new activities. Um, she brings ideas, passion, and clarity to all of our Ag Bio Data tasks and events. So thank you, Monica, for being a star. <laughs> we love you. 
Um, and for the verification award, I just want to highlight um, the nomination form for David was great. Um, he's one of the developers of the quintessential verification tool, the FAIR headers FASTA file. Um, it's a, a, a piece of code to make reported genome sequences traceable through downstream manipulations and analysis. Um, it provides provenance for genome sequences in perpetuity, and its design is both very small and simple to adopt, which we all love, <laughs> um, and it's just providing huge benefits to the community. So thank you, David. We, we appreciate you, um, and all four of you are wonderful. Thank you. And so with that, we hear, yeah. <laughs> yes, a round of applause for them. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, we are going to take an eight minute break. Um, so wherever you are in the world, it will be at the top of the hour in eight minutes, we will come back and start our discussions. I'd encourage you to definitely come back. We had great discussions yesterday, and this is really a great opportunity to help the working groups hear from the rest of the network and, and steer their efforts in a direction that's beneficial for all of us. Um, so we will resume uh, at the top of the hour. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, everyone is back. So we have uh, now the reporting from the working groups. Uh, and so, so let's go first, maybe, with the RNA-seq, Ben. Um, yeah, so this is going to be really tough to summarize um, our discussion. There were there was a lot of really really good commentary, um, and I think like a a uh, more than tacit acknowledgement that um, this is a really important topic of um, you know having meta exist you know um, standardized metadata and standardized data um, deposition in access in you know publicly available databases and um you know focused on like accessibility and and streamline um and so uh you know I, I guess there was um a lot of um comments on how do we make sure that uh researchers who are generating the data are making their um raw data and also their their metadata available to people who are reading their research and trying to um reinterpret or or reuse their research um, and so uh, some of it was was focused on the um, the, the publication system. So any, anywhere from you know the journals to the reviewers um, to sort of a post publication process um, where you know we we try to make people uh, feel as though if they want to publish their paper, they have to conform to a set of standards for reporting um, their data. Some of this exists already, but you know I think that. Um, there, there is a, a need for uh, more strict enforcement. Um, there are some um, ideas about uh, training and educating potential reviewers, um, you know, maybe students and postdocs, um, for you know how to how to read a paper um, critically with an eye towards um, data reproducibility. Um, making a um, and, and for for um, for data generators, um, having a um, a list of really nice um, repositories um, that they can use to make that whole process easier of, of reviewing their their, their paper uh, so that people kind of know what to expect. Um, there was some uh, griping about how difficult uh, this process is at the moment, um, which I 100% agree with that it's um, it's it can be very nebulous for um, for getting your data um, reported on some of these repositories. Um, and so, you know, there, there might need to be some coordinated actions from, you know, all across the the publication process. Yeah, like like I said, from the from the journals all the way down to the uh, to the reviewers and the data generators. Um, we all have to be kind of rowing the same boat on um, on uh, making making data more available. Um, there's also, you know, some effort on the or some discussion around the repositories. You know, how do we uh, make sure that in order to submit to a um, standard repository that enough of the metadata um, is being reported um, for that study. Um, is there a way to automate this process? Um, you know, is, or does it rely on, on post-publication um, review? Um, and then, you know, there's uh, uh, carrots and sticks, you know, for um, enforcement. Um, you know, can we um, uh, tag papers that are good at reporting the data, papers that are bad at reporting their data? 
Um, can we give out an award for, you know, the most amount of uh, metadata published, um, you know, something that's been done in the, um, in the, the worm community. Uh, we, we learned that there's like a little trophy that people get for um, scoring um, really highly on these, um, uh, on these metrics. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, like I said, this is, this is tough to sort of summarize all of this. Um, but um, but yeah, so you know, th there's also discussion about um, visualization tools, um, and maybe in order to have access to um, hosting your data on visualization tools, you have to adhere to a certain metadata standard. Um, and uh, yeah, I I'd say that that's that's the um, the thirty thousand foot summary. Um, am I missing anything, just from our senior? I, I think what we thought was to make a list of repository where we can submit single cell data mm -hmm. uh, and then compare what kind of the information is required and optional between different repositories, for example, NCBI and Array Express or FlexDB or something. And mm -hmm. just maybe get back to those repositories with our recommendations that what should be uh, absolutely required uh, that makes data reusable. So I think that could be one easy way and we might have to contact less number of people and standardize that part. So that could be very effective. Second thing we thought maybe we need to train our younger generation uh, who will get involved with the paper reviews and publication reviews that when they have a paper with the big data, how do they data, how do they review the data and data uh, where it is being deposited and what quality it has. And so we thought maybe we can come up with uh, some kind of tutorial, some kind of discussions and recommendations that you review the scientific paper, but also review the data. So that is something that is lacking at this point. Uh, and then there is third is that uh, we really don't have any enforcement uh, to comply the community uh, with submitting the metadata. The only enforcement we have, you know, when they deposit the data to different repositories. So other things could be only encouraging. And so encouragement can come via, you know, educa education, tutorials, and, you know, getting people involved. Uh, the other part is that other than NCBI or Array Express, there are now individual data centers in China, India, and other countries, Brazil. And so they might like to deposit their own data in their repositories, and they may be a little different in terms of the uh, data annotation and metadata requirement. So perhaps, you know, reaching out to the communities that are in the global south and, you know, bring those on board. Uh, yeah. So that would be another challenge. Yeah. So we have pretty much covered everything. So only one thing that I just would like to add here. So uh, FANG is like, you know, for animal genomes, they have very good pipelines. So they have automatic validation of the Excel spreadsheet that is submitted by the users for single cell RNA-seq metadata ingestion. So we can compare with that, with NCBI and with Anotier and see that where are the gaps existed and we can have some sort of uniform standard uh, pipeline that can be used for all the domains. Yeah, that is another suggestion, you know, we can use. Yeah. And then other thing we thought about the visualization tools and analysis tools. So maybe some of the existing tools and platforms such as like the ATOM, plant ATOM, uh, you know, biopsych based databases, uh, they are open. So, you know, it's not restricted whether they are to the whole tissue or, you know, whole plant or single cell data. People can upload any type of data and analyze that. So they are all great tools. So we don't really have to reinvent the uh, visualize uh, to reinvent the tools for visualizing single cell data. So we could also make a list of uh, secondary platforms that help to analyze data beyond the data submission and test them out and see what are their limitations and how we can you know improve some of the infrastructure that already exists for data analysis and tools thank you thanks Ben. thanks uh, sushma yeah go ahead and next one so the so next one is the our sustainability and sabri are you going to present that or is uh, it i'm gonna go, i'm gonna do that one okay okay go yep. ahead man okay Yep, let me give you a rundown of our um, very wide ranging and great conversation. Um, it, it, so we kind of started with a shared problem, which is recruiting talented team members, recruiting, hiring, and keeping them <laughs> um, 
And, and we kind of discussed, we really need to determine clearly if it's a problem because we lack sufficient resources or because we lack a pipeline of talent or if it's both and we need to design targeted solutions. Um, and there's good things. Um, I can bio curation and working on database can be engaging and it can offer a lot of social value and meaning. Um, but we're also kind of competing against private industry that's going to offer um, higher salaries and things like that. Um, so one one comment was um, we may need to get a little bit more creative in how we hire. Um, perhaps establishing nonprofits outside of universities or academic settings to manage hiring and to do things a little more efficiently. Future planning, um, we kind of turn to a much more positive, sunny outlook. Um, we need a plan. Um, and if we think about if we had a lot of resources, what would we do with them? Let's build the dream vision and, and put that in front of the funding agencies. And if you show them what we can do and that we have a path um, that where we can coordinate, we have a national vision that could be really powerful. Um, the EU in particular appears a little bit better coordinated at a large scale than the US. We have some catch up to do. Um, but if we have a solid plan and a vision and we put that into um, a white paper for sustainability, that's going to be quite compelling. Um, and so there's a lot of bright future ahead. Uh, we also talked about the importance of lobbying and effectively uh, communicating our needs and priorities. Um, ag businesses have clout and want data and databases. So we need to be building partnerships with them. Um, there's some unique public-private um, entities. John mentioned FR, which he he has a lot of um, collaborations with. That might be a good one to look at. Um, but overall, we need to coordinate across groups, um, and we need to communicate to groups from our industry stakeholders to our funders and legislators, um, connecting those dots from the databases to real-world impact and real-world problems. Power numbers. So as a group, we need to get organized, target those high-priority needs, perhaps even go bigger than data than just ag and go for all the data. Um, and finally, we talked a little bit about getting grants to work together, um, encouraging people don't build new tools, don't necessarily build new databases, let's use what we've got. Um, indirect some federal grants can be really um, cost prohibitive <laughs> to success. 40 to 60% overhead can be really challenging. Dory mentioned um, creating a service center with an 8% overhead. So again, get creative at your universities and academic settings. Um, how can we make sure those funds get put toward the databases? Um, and we have a link in our document, and I think John put it in the chat as well, to um, a National Academy's uh, memo about land-grant university collaboration and coordination, getting, getting these really large-scale projects coordinated across all of our land grants and how powerful that could be. Um, so, yep, that's about a summary of, of what, what we talked about. If anyone else wants to add anything I missed. Great. So uh, is anybody from the other groups, like people who are in sustainability, would like to say something for the RNA seek or if people who are in the RNA seek like to have any comment for the sustainability folks? Otherwise, we are done for the day, Anarita. Would you like to take? Yes, so thank you again for the people that joined today. So I just want to remind that the third day will be on May 2nd, so on Thursday at 9 a.m. Central Time. We will have other the data reuse, which is another ending working group, and then phenotypic data standard, standardization and management, a new working group, diversity, equity, inclusion, and fair scientific literature. And then at the end, we will have also a 30 minutes briefing about the future of AgBioData, and I invite everybody to join us for that. And with this, I will close today's session and thanks everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.